Hi. Today we will be doing a short Seascape demonstration for our tag-based advanced ladder editor in Seascape. We will be going through variable handling, ladder creation, screen creation, and debugging. If you would like a further explanation outside of Seascape for our tag-based advanced ladder editor, you can find an extended video on our YouTube channel at Horner APG Europe. Before we begin, to make sure that we can use tag-based programming, you need to go to Click Tools across the top, go down to Application Settings, and ensure that Advanced Ladder with Tags is checked as an option under Support Program Types. So to begin, I'm going to the top left of my screen, click File and New. I'm now presented with the option to choose between three different logic styles. Advanced Ladder Editor, which is register-based, IEC editor, and advanced ladder editor with tags, which is what we will be using today. OK, so I'm going to select it and hit OK. With register-based advanced ladder, we would usually manage our variables with the program I.O. names window, but in tag-based programming, we use the program variables window. If yours is not appearing like mine is, go here across the top of your screen to the Tools tab. Scroll down and select the program's variables. You can pin it to wherever you want on the screen and resize it as you wish. So now, let's take a look at what we have as the default in our program variables window. First of all, we have two different types of category, global variables and retained variables. Both global and retained variables are accessible anywhere in the program, unlike how their names may suggest. Retained variables are variables that retain their value from their last power down, where global variables essentially always start at zero. There are no variables defined under retained variables yet, but under global variables there is a list of predefined variables. This predefined list is for things like real-world I.O., network global data, system bits, system registers, and function key type data. These are predefined but not really required and can be deleted. There are also array variables. AI, for example, is an array variable that has been dimensioned to 512, so it's from 0 to 511, and it's mapped to percent %AI1. So effectively, this is a default array of analog input levels that are mapped from AI1 to AI512. As we create variables, by default, they will show up in global variables. But if you want them to be retained, you'll need to move them down under the retained variables heading. We also have some predefined structures in this window for PID and timers. So now that we've taken a look at program variables, let's start building some logic and see how it compares to when we create logic in register-based programming. I'm going to go ahead and build a simple start-stop circuit. So we'll first grab a normally open contact from here on the left and place it down, this creating a new rung. It's now prompting me to input a variable or address that I want to assign to this contact. If you remember, from register-based programming, we had to define the register location and, if we chose, an I.O. name to go along with it. But here, we just have one choice. So we can either select a variable or just create a new one. So I'm going to do just that. I'm naming it start underscore pb for start push button and hitting OK. So straight away, Seascape recognizes that this is not an existing variable and asks if I want to create the variable, to which I'm going to say yes. This next tool that's popped up is one that's probably unfamiliar to you if you haven't used our tag based editor before. This is where you define things such as the type of this new variable, if it's global or retained or even part of a different user group, which is a system where you can group your variables together. You can also map your variable to a specific location through the attribute tag. For now though, this all looks good, so I'm going to say yes. And as you can see, the start pb variable that has been created has automatically appeared in my global variables tab in my program variables window. To continue, I'm going to go ahead and create a stop push button by placing a normally closed contact down on that same rung. I'm naming it stop underscore pb, and I'm selecting OK. 
So it's Boolean and everything by default is fine. So I'm going to click yes and as you can see it's added itself to my program variables window. Next I'm going to place a coil down and call it motor. So again it allows me to create these as I go. The type is correct and everything looks good. So I click OK and I have motor created. Next I have to provide a seal around the start button. To create this I'm using two branches and a normally open contact. So in this case motor is already created so I could just start typing it in and once it finds it it will fill in the rest. The other method I could do is I could press this button here which shows me all of the predefined variables which I can choose from. But from now we'll just stick with the original typing it in approach. Okay, so now I've completed this simple start stop wrong. Let's take a look at a couple of different scenarios. First, we'll look at a scenario where the stop push button is mapped to a real world digital input. So let's say on the OCS that digital input number 5, percentile 5, is the physical input where the stop push button is going to be wired. So right now, the stop push button is being handled as an internal variable. There's no specific memory address tied to it, as Seascape is assigning something in the background. If I want this to be tied to the real world input 5, I'm going to need to map it to a specific address to ensure that this variable comes from that specific input. So to do this, I'm going to go to my stop underscore pb variable in my program variables window go across to the tag column and add in percent %i5. What this means is that when Seascape runs this program, it will look specifically to input number 5 for, st for the stop push button. Even though this is tag based programming and you don't have to assign registers and memory locations for, for each variable, there are certainly scenarios where you do have to assign them. For, th for example, in this case with real world IO. Motor is another variable that will need to be mapped to a specific output. So let's say it's output 3 or Q3. So let's go to the motor variable and across to the tag column and add percent %Q3. So next, let's say start push button is a touch screen. To handle this, we have to go to our screen editor, which is accessed through this icon at the top of our screen. To begin, let's place a button on the screen, which we're going to use for our start push button. To configure, double click and we're going to make it round and give it a 3D bezel. To name the button, select legend and we're going to name it start. We're going to enlarge the font and to change the color. To do this we have to go to our indicator properties. We're going to set the on color to light green and the off color to dark green. OK, so we've defined this push button in every way except which variable it's tied to. So in this case we want our button to be connected to our start push button variable. To do this I can either start typing in the name or click this to clear and search my list of variables. My start push button is set to a register width of 1 bit and everything else has already been predefined. So I'm going to select OK. So here's our start push button that's tied to our start underscore pb variable. It would also be very useful to know when the motor is running. So I'm going to grab an indicator from this icon up at the top left of my screen and place it down next to my push button. Next, I want to configure my indicator. And to do this, again, I double click and then select legend. I'm naming it motor run and I'm going to enlarge the font a small bit. We're going to leave the colors alone, but also select 3D bezel again. When connecting to a variable, I can start typing it in or select it from my list of variables. So as I start typing motor, you can see that it auto filled. And so we're finished and we can select OK. Now we're going back to our logic editor. The next step is to download the program to the controller. But the save time, I've done this already. So make sure that before you move on, that you've downloaded the program to the controller. Our earlier project has now been downloaded and is currently in run mode, but we wanted to bug it. 
To do this, click this debug icon across the top of the screen. As you can see, we have the availability of power flow on the stop push button, but none anywhere else. If we go to our start push button, it is controlled by the touch screen. So I'm going to go ahead and touch it. And you'll probably hear a beep. And now I've released the push button, and as you can see, the deeper debugging works very well. Okay, that's just simple Boolean logic, creating variables as you program. Okay, so now let's take a look at timers. Timers are dealt with a little differently in tag-based ladder than they are in register-based, although it is very similar. To review, we know that timers and counters take up two consecutive words. The first word being the accumulator, for instance, what the elapsed time is. And the second word is what we call the housekeeping register. That's the one that we need to make sure we don't step on with the rest of our program. So how do we do that with tag-based logic? Because we really need two variables assigned to that timer or counter. In Seascape 9.9 SB3, we have added predefined structures. So within the program variables window, we can see these. You can see we have some for PID and both timer counter 16 and timer counter 32. For this example, I'm going to use timer counter 16, which is a 16 bit timer. We need to right click on global variable or retain variable, depending on if we want the value to be retained on power down or not. For this example, I'm going to use a global variable and I'm going to call it motor timer. If I click under type and scroll down, you will see timer counter 16. So I'm going to click on this variable and now I'm using it as a predefined structure of a 16 bit timer. I'm going to move my program variables window to make space to create a simple timer. So what we're going to do is set up a timer to time whenever the motor is running. So I'll create a new run here, add in a normally open contact, and type in our variable motor. And as you can see, it autofills. Next, I'm going to grab a timer from the here on the left and place it down on a new run. For the timer address, I'm going to use this drop down and find our motor timer variable. So, our 100 millisecond resolution is fine. I could also assign a variable here to my preset, which I am going to do. So I'm going to select this button here and I can start typing in my new variable, which I'm going to do and call timer preset. Next, it prompts me that timer preset does not exist and what I like to create it as a new variable, which I'm going to select OK. So now, it's, now it shows timer preset as an unsigned integer, which is the one that I want. If I want it to be retained, I can change the user group from global to retained. And I do, so I will. It's a non-dimensioned variable, so I'll leave the dimensions as they are. I don't need to map or tag it to a specific memory location, so I'm going to leave this section blank. So now everything is set, and we can click OK. So now I have my timer that's been assigned to motor timer and my preset that's been assigned to timer preset. Okay, so now we're going to add this timer and this preset to the screen that we created earlier. So to enter, click this icon up along the top of our screen. Now that my screen view has popped up, I'm going to place down two data objects, one for my timer and one for my preset value. So let's make this one the preset value. It's going to be a 16-bit wide variable, and we're going to set it as a decimal format. We're setting our variable as the preset variable from this drop-down list. You may notice retained variables have a different icon which looks similarly to a disk. We're setting the format for 1234.1 because we plan on using decimals, as well as setting our text to motor timer preset. So we have our first data object for the preset and instead of creating our second one from scratch, let's just copy paste and edit this one. So first, I'm going to change from timer preset to motor timer. The elapsed time will be in seconds, so our format won't change. This object is read only, not read write, so we're going to have to disable the edit write section. Lastly, 
we're going to set our legend text to elapsed time and hit OK and OK. So we have added our preset value and our elapsed time. And to save time, I've already downloaded my program offline. So make sure you do that before continuing. As you make programming changes and want to test them, you have to download them to the controller. Before we can really test this, we need to make sure that there's a value on our timer preset as we made it editable on the screen. You won't be able to see me changing it, but I'm making it 15 seconds. Now, let's enter debugging mode, and we do this by clicking this icon up across the top of our screen. So as you can see, our preset is set to 15 seconds, and we're ready to test it. So I'm going to ahead and start the motor using the data watch window. And as you can see, we're timing and it's working fine. So we've covered Boolean logic and we've covered timers and counters. So that's our demonstration finished for today's tutorial.